In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Well, before I start my uh, sermon, I really want to thank you, one, for the time away to meet our new baby niece. So Vanessa's youngest sister had her first child, Isla Marie, weighing in at, drum roll, 10 pounds. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Look at that. All the women. That, woo, oh. Seven pounds, 14 ounces. A beautiful baby girl. I quite, and I'm biased towards my children, and as we all are, but I might be the prettiest little baby I have ever laid my eyes on. Just gorgeous. So I really appreciate that. Second thing is, while I was away, of all the emails that I get, I love this one email, or I got like five emails about really fun questions from you all that have to do with the sermon, who said, hey, can you preach out there in the middle again and walk around like you used to do? And the answer is yes. Next week, I'm back. I'm dancing again, right out there in the front. I come here because when we move to being online, it keeps me anchored in Mr. Powell, who does a fine job back there in the back as a volunteer and as our treasurer and as wears many hats here at the church, pretty much could do what I do, honestly. Don't want to make his life too difficult. So those are enough about the announcements, but thank you for the time away with family and to meet Isla Marie and also yes to the middle. We'll be back. So this reading from Mark, I know the many ways that it has been interpreted over the years, and the many ways that different sides who to me are both so shallow in their approach to the scriptures seem to interpret these things. But for me, at the core of what's going on here in the Gospel of Mark intersects with what we're doing in this series on joy here at St. Luke's. Today we're focusing on and will focus on it in our time together as I interview and talk to Scott Beachy, encountering joy through learning. Part of what's underneath this exchange between Jesus and the disciples and Jesus and the Pharisees is this notion of learning. We can't take the pieces about divorce separate from the piece that follows about little children. You see, when we're so literal or when we open the Bible with an agenda, we tend to only see what we want to see. But really what's going on here is Jesus is reminding us of a core tenet of the faith that has been true from the time of the Israelites. And that is to understand God, we must learn. We must grow. We must enter into God's presence like a little child not as somebody who thinks they have it all figured out, not as somebody who thinks they can solve all the world's problems, but as somebody who is humble, who is meek, and who is mild, comes in the presence of God to take God in and encounter the living Christ in the form of a vulnerable babe. Now you have to imagine for Jesus to make that correlation and to draw that connection, he too was a vulnerable child dependent upon Mary and Joseph for his life. I don't know how often we stop and think about that reality. The early church is full of teaching and, and embracing the reality that Jesus himself, like all of us in this room, like little sweet Isla Marie, who can do nothing on her own right now, and that Jeff and Liesel are her parents and are caring for her, Jesus was in that same boat. Right? Y'all believe that? He was a babe, a vulnerable child, dependent upon Mary and Joseph. And we have to believe that as Jesus grew up, he learned from his father, Joseph, how to be a carpenter. That's what Jewish children did in Israel in the earliest days of their life. He was soaking up all of this knowledge. Now, of course, of course, slight difference between you and me, although I've met some people who think this way, he was God incarnate, which we don't hold that. He was God incarnate as well as Jesus the human, all equal at the same time. So when they have this exchange about divorce and about marriage and about all of that, it's really not so much the content of what's happening here and about, okay, this is the right way. 
It's about the fact that the Pharisees think they have it all figured out. They're coming in front of God and saying, God, here is the box I want to put you in. You need to fit in my box. Whereas Jesus is saying, you have no clue what box God is in. And let me go ahead and set you straight. This is why we gave you this commandment, because you were hard of heart, because you lacked understanding about what real relationships built on love are for. You have forgotten. Now, you have to remember, Jesus has been watching the religious elite in his day, right? He's been watching them breaking relationships, lining people up and deciding who's in and who's out. While at the same time, hypocritically deciding what they get to do and what they don't get to do as the religious elite. Need, let's remind ourselves of that wonderful image of the Pharisee in the temple and the tax collector and the Pharisee who stands there in prayer to God and says, thank God I'm not like that guy. Now, how many of us sitting here today by a show of hands in our prayers look around the room and go, thank God I'm not like that girl or guy. Go ahead, raise your hands high if you do that. We want to get a good look at you, right? No. <laughs> right, I mean, that's not what it's about because the guy the Pharisees pointing to, the tax collector, the one that the Pharisees have decided is out, is over there beating his breast saying, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. He's not pretending that he's somehow more righteous than everybody else or more perfect than everybody else. He's merely recognizing his dependence. He's encountering God in the temple in a humble, mild way, knowing who he is, knowing that he's not perfect knowing that he doesn't have all the answers and that he will learn. You see, children learn so much from all of us. We have a responsibility as adults to the younger generations. You know, a lot of what we hear today is, oh, they're so crazy or, oh, they're so this or they're so that. And if you rewind hint in history, when all of us were younger, people were looking at us saying we were crazy. Right? I remember my granddad looking at my dad in the 70s saying, what is wrong with you people? You have lost your minds. And now I'm looking at my dad's generation, looking at us going, what is wrong with you people? You have lost your minds. But what's missing at times is the responsibility to teach, to teach our faith. And I don't mean get out and memorize your Bibles. I know lots of people who can spit off scripture to me. If I said, what's Psalm 119 for? They would spit it right out to me. But yet there's something else missing. I'm talking about inviting people in to encounter God in learning about how we've grown in our faith. And when we teach people, when we teach people about our faith, that's how we open our hearts to our journey. That's how we open the doors to letting people see the good, the bad, and the ugly. Because you see, there's people wandering around in this world who see a church that's more about judgment and condemnation, and they're reading a Bible that seems to be a lot about love and life, and they're having a hard time reconciling the two together. And as a pastor, I have to admit at times, I'm having a hard time reconciling this kind of narrative that exists out there. What we have to remember as people of faith, we're not people like the Pharisees. We're not here as God's gatekeepers. God doesn't need us to protect him. God doesn't need us to line everybody up and decide who's in and out and then hand God a report. Here you go, God. Here's the people that get to enter the kingdom and here's the people that are going, you, my neighbor. Right down. That's not what God needs. God needs us to open our hearts and lives and to teach people about Jesus. And that's what Jesus is trying to convey to his disciples today. God doesn't need us to have all the answers. God needs us to be like a child, soaking up the reality of God in and around us. Because the myth we tell ourselves is that somehow God's not moving in the world if we're not doing something. 
God's doing God's thing, whether we participate in it or not. The Gospel of Luke reminds us that. Chapter 10, the harvest is happening. Please send more laborers into the harvest. Not The harvest is not going to happen until you send some laborers out. God is moving in the harvest. What we have to realize today, more than any other time in our life, that we must be, as our opening hymn stated so clearly, a people of joy, a people who are willing to teach, a people who are willing to learn about God, not just in scripture, that's important, but in the tradition that we've inherited, in the development of the church from the earliest days to today. Let me remind us that in the earliest days of the church, they gathered in homes and in that home were intergenerational gatherings of people. You had great grandparents all the way down to great grandchildren in the same house together, learning and caring for one another. The older we get, the more responsibility we have of raising up the next leaders and learning from them. Learning about God and learning about our faith are some of the core things we should be doing as a people of God. Because the more we learn, the more we encounter God, the more we encounter the radical love of the gospel, and the more we realize what our job is. Our job is not to be a Pharisee. Our job is to be like the tax collector. Our job is to grow, to wrestle, and to do it in community a community grounded in love, in hope. This is what it's about to be a people of God. This is what it means to truly embrace and encounter God. We must learn and we must open ourselves up to be teachers, not who tell people one plus one is two, but to tell people our story, our journey, our struggles, our joy. Because if you do that, you're gonna be a place where someone encounters God in just the way they need to. Amen.